My name is Sasha Meinrath. I direct uh, New America Foundation's Open Technology Initiative, which is sort of the tech and telecom arm of the Foundation's work. However, you are not here to listen to me so much as this gentleman to my left, Neil Stevenson, who is probably most well known as an author who uh, not only helped shape an entire literary genre, but to this very day continues to extend the boundaries of science fiction and how we view that genre. And so he's spent over a quarter of a century now uh, writing books. And there's, depending on how you want to define book, about a dozen or so of them, dating back to 1984 with the big U, Zodiac, Snow Crash, Interface, The Diamond Age, Cobweb, Cryptonomicon, um, one of my favorites, uh, The Baroque Cycle and Anathem, which I'm about 750 pages into right now. I'm enjoying greatly, all the way to present day, The Mongoliad, which uh, we'll talk about a little bit later. And I wanted to set a, sort of set a tone uh, in Neil Stevenson's own words. Uh, you wrote, uh, a novel represents hard, years of hard work distilled into a few hundred pages, with all or at least most of the bad ideas cut out and thrown away, and the good ideas polished and refined as much as possible. Interacting with an author in person is nothing like reading his novels. Just about every, everyone who gets an opportunity to meet with an author in person ends up feeling mildly let down and in some cases, grievously disappointed. <laughs> These are humble words. And I'm hoping that today... Uh, humble words and a knockout introduction. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So for those of you that are hoping that we're going to be talking about smileys or the reclusive Neil Stevenson, or understanding the, the mysteries of Enoch Root, uh, you will no doubt be disappointed. Uh, but for the rest of us, I'm hoping that the next hour will sort of confound your expectations of your perceptions of our conversation here today. Now, as a fellow technologist, which is what we're going to focus on today, uh, you've helped create a private space launch company, that's Blue Origins. You've inaugurated a lab dedicated to creating new inventions, that's the Intellectual Venture Labs. And you've co-founded a startup company in the realm of what you call electronic transmedia publishing at Subidai Corporation. So let me begin by simply asking you, are you a super geek with a writing problem? <laughs> well, the, uh, the, the, the geekiness and the writing problem uh, for me have always been kind of complementary in that uh, I learned pretty early in my career that uh, if I tried to kind of apply uh, a Protestant work ethic to the job and work, you know, an eight-hour day every day, um, uh, I would end up uh, writing some relatively decent material first thing in the morning and then spend the rest of the day sort of burying it in, in crap. And then I would have to go back later and try to separate <clears throat> the good stuff out from the, the bad stuff. So. Um, and that never works. I mean, uh, doing heavy editing on prose is a little bit like doing surgery on a living body. Um, you can kind of stitch everything back together, but it never works the same. And there's always scar tissue uh, left in the result. So uh, what I found out was that it was better to do some writing for an hour or two uh, in the morning until I started to uh, lose momentum and then stop and uh, do something else for the rest of the day. And um, so I've had a number of geeky pursuits that I've tended to pursue during the afternoons, specifically as a way to get my mind off of whatever project I'm working on uh, and let the kind of mysterious, ineffable background processes do whatever it is that they do. And I was, lo I was looking for a way to sort of summarize the last day's themes that emerged from the conversations that were happening. Uh, and I came across what I'll call a brief autobiographical sketch that you'd written. This is from 2004, but I read it online, so I know it must be true. And this is a bit after Snow Crash came out. Uh, you talked about a memorable moment in your book tour that touched on many of the ideas discussed at this week's Future Tense event. So bear with me for just a moment. Quote, I was doing a reading signing at White Dwarf Books in Vancouver. William Gibson stopped by to say hello and extended his hand as if to shake. But I remembered something Bruce Sterling had told me. 
for at that time, Sterling and I had formed a pact to fight Gibson. <laughs> Gibson had been regrown from a vat of scraps of DNA after Sterling had crashed his LNG tanker into Gibson's stealth pleasure barge in the Straits of Juan de Fuco. During the regeneration process, telescoping carbonite stilettos had been incorporated into Gibson's arms. Remembering this in the nick of time, I grabbed the signing table and flipped it up between us. Of course, the carbonite stilettos pierced through it as if it were cork board, but this spoiled his aim long enough for me to whip out my wakizashi from between my shoulder blades and swing at his head. He deflected the blow with a force blast that sprained my wrist. The falling table knocked over a space heater and set fire to the store. <coughs> Slowly, I gained the upper hand, for on defense, his praying mantis style was no match for my flying cloud technique, but I lost him behind a cloud of smoke. Then I had to get out of the place. The streets were crowded with his black-suited minions, and I had to turn into a swarm of locusts and fly back to Seattle. So this begs the question. <laughs> How much of your fiction is drawn from real life? <laughs> and vice versa. Um, but more importantly, I mean, your ability to weave real technology into the narratives that you write uh, make for a particularly compelling narrative amongst technologists and geeks. But you've also populated these plots that you've been writing uh, with elements of martial arts, sword play in particular. Can you talk a little bit about this process of interweaving sort of personal interests of yours within this profoundly public medium? Well, the... Uh, <clears throat> Any narrative works better and is more compelling and involving to the reader if it contains some you know, concrete details that uh, um, uh, kind of convince the reader at a subliminal level that the world being depicted is coherent, that it makes sense, that it follows a set of, of rules. Uh, and it's when, um, it's when uh, a writer kind of... Uh, carelessly or inadvertently um, builds in little inconsistencies uh, to the, the description that um, the, the reader begins to get a kind of nervous sense that somehow the writer's not playing fair or, or there, there, there's something wrong. And, and that's when um, the suspension of disbelief breaks down and, and the, whole, the whole project just fails. So uh, one way to... Um, kind of ensure or at least create the illusion of uh, internal consistency in a narrative is to supply a lot of uh, nitty-gritty specific details and different writers uh, do that in different ways. Um, so it doesn't have to be uh, technology or, or martial arts or, or, or things like that. It could be uh, emotional details uh, of a relationship between two people. Uh, you know, if it if it feels right, if the character is behaving um, in in a, a manner that seems internally consistent, um, then the book works and uh, and the reader has a good time with it. Um, in my case, uh, since I sort of have access to a great big junk heap in my mind of of bits of knowledge about geeky stuff. Uh, the sort of easy, natural reflex for me is to resort to that. Um, and so um, it's, it's easy for me to describe a scene in terms of some piece of technology that's lying around or some physical action that's going on uh, in a way that um, sort of cons the reader into believing that it's really true. Gotcha. So I'm about, uh, as I mentioned, 750 pages into Anathem. I really feel like the plot's beginning to take off now. And, uh, <laughs> but I, I, it is... It takes a while to get the turbines spun up. That's right. It, it is a fantastic read, particularly if, like me, your background is not in technology, but you're a closeted sort of philosopher and a closeted sort of interest in different perspectives on what reality is and how it's gleaned. And I'm curious because, you know, you've sort of created this space of sort of the ultimate ivory tower, this cloistered, mathic space versus sort of the more secular world. And so this has been sort of turning around in my mind uh, late at night while my, my daughter's keeping me up at 3 a.m. And I'm, I'm wondering, like, 
what do you see as sort of the role of universities in, in this reality uh, in terms of knowledge generation, technological innovation? It seems that in recent decades, their role has really been shifting a lot. They've taken on a much more corporate uh, sort of uh, uh, facade. Are, are these ac academies and universities, are they a, a boon to civil society, a tolerated necessary evil, or something else entirely? My mind's drifting because somebody's cooking bacon back there. <laughs> um, that's probably not going to come through on the web feed, but um, it smells like bacon. Uh, so the, the world that's described in, in Anathem, for those who haven't seen the book, or Anathem, I don't care how it's pronounced, um, is uh, um, a world in which essentially all of the literate, rational people have been rounded up and herded into a system of, of monasteries where they live according to a strict vow of poverty and have zero uh, interaction with the, uh, what, what's called the secular world. Um, using secular not to mean uh, non-religious, uh, because it tends to be a fairly religious place, but in the sense of uh, concern with kind of day-to-day -day goings on. So um, in the middle of this kind of endless landscape of Walmarts and casinos, there are these walled enclosures uh, with sort of Gothic towers and, uh, and cloisters in them where um, where all of the kind of book reading people hang out together and, um, and philosophize. So um, the creation of that world was uh, a reaction to a couple of different uh, stimuli that penetrated my awareness uh, around 2000, I guess you could say. One was the, uh, the clock of the Long Now being undertaken by the, uh, the Long Now Foundation. Uh, uh, and in, uh, Can you describe this clock a little bit? Because it is a, a fascinating project. Yeah, so, so this is uh, an idea that I started hearing about in the mid-90s from Danny Hillis and uh, Xander Rose and Stuart Brand. Uh, the idea is to construct a uh, clock that can run for 10,000 years and um, have it be sort of to this society what, what say pyramids or cathedrals might have been to other societies. Uh, and um, when, when I first heard about it, uh, I, you know, my question for those guys was, is this meant to be a technological tour de force that can run that long without any maintenance or human intervention? Uh, or are you going to assume that there is a, uh, a society of people that's going to keep it running? Because uh, I could see doing it either way, and, and both approaches would be interesting in different ways. But for me, um, the, the trying to imagine what that surrounding community might look like uh, was was a pretty interesting project. So um, the uh, around around the year 2000, um, they were trying to spruce up their website, and so they asked me and several other people to contribute just informal kind of back of napkin sketches of what we imagined the clock might look like. Uh, not as serious engineering proposals, but just to give some idea of how they, uh, their, this idea had affected different people's thinking. Um, and so the sketch that I drew um, depicted a clock tower surrounded by concentric walls, uh, and the walls had gates in them that were controlled by the internal workings of the clock in the same way that the little door on a cuckoo clock is controlled by its internal clockwork. And the idea was that uh, in the outer wall, the gate would open once a year for a few days. And during that time, people could freely go in and out. But if you chose to be on the inside of the gate when the door closed, it meant that you were, dedic you were uh, making a commitment to spend one year uh, inside those walls and not have contact with the outside world during that time. And inside of that was... Kind of like grad school. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's kind of like um, undergrad school. And then grad school is the next layer in, which is a 10-year uh, door. And then there's a 100-year door on the inside, which is for tenured professors. Uh, so, um, uh, so that was kind of the, the scheme that I drew. And it was motivated uh, by the fact that... Um, Around the end of the century, um, 
uh, a lot of newspapers, as they always do, were publishing their sort of end of year news roundup and uh, the end of decade uh, news roundup. And some of them were going so far as to publish end of century and end of millennium uh, news roundups, you know, the bubonic plague, uh, the Protestant Reformation, you know, et cetera. Uh, and looking at those, it just occurred to me that um, uh, every day I sit down and spend some time reading the paper, and 24 hours later, there's another paper with other stuff in it. Uh, and why am I spending all of this time every day reading these things when I could just wait until the end of the year and read the important stuff? Um, and so uh, that's kind of how I got going on that train of thought. So, so Anathem uh, is a book that I wrote about four or five years later after that idea had been kind of rolling around in my subconscious for that long and, uh, and mixed in with it is a certain element of, of um, kind of uh, you know, reacting to the way that, uh, that science and, uh, and kind of rational thought in general got, uh, got treated um, during those years in, in public discourse. Now, in, um, in Egypt this week, uh, government shut down most of the main communications networks that people use in their everyday lives. Uh, and at the same time, many people were finding ways to sort of skirt around these firewalls and to speak with each other, one another inside Egypt, but also with the outside world. And I, I think, you know, one of the themes that runs through a lot of science fiction is this notion of, you know, we've created this relationship where people in struggle build technologies for liberation. And I think, you know, when I look at a lot of the political evolutions or revolutions that are happening around the globe, uh, is there a role for leading writers such as yourself for inspiring sort of the next generations of young people who are struggling for justice and thinking about how technology might be a part of that, et cetera? Um, well, I'd hate to volunteer, uh, but the, um, uh, I, I don't know if it's writers necessarily. There's, there's usually someone uh, around whom those things kind of nucleate. And uh, in this case, it appears to be Muhammad el Baradai. Um, you know, so if you show up in the wrong place at the wrong time with a bullhorn in front of your face uh, and someone snaps a picture, then guess what? You're now the glorious leader of the revolution, uh, whether you like it or not. So um, I guess stay away from bullhorns and cameras is, is kind of the answer there. Uh, I don't know nowadays, though, if it's really writers who uh, are generally going to have that role. Um, it's, um, you know, I think we've certainly been eclipsed in the popular imagination by uh, uh, more charismatic humans, um, and um, and that 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 may be a good thing. I don't know. So you wouldn't put the writers in charge. In charge. <laughs> You've talked about charge. the platonic ideal and all that. Yeah. Is there a, um, that a would place be a, for these? That would be an interesting scenario. I'm, I'm, I think you may have just given me an idea for uh, a new <laughs> dystopian science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So let's talk a little bit about decline. Okay. And uh, <coughs> about a half decade ago, uh, you had a an article in Reason Magazine where you say that our prosperity and our military security for the last three or four generations have been rooted in science and technology and it would therefore seem that we're coming to the end of one era and about to move into another. And my question for you really centers around kind of this, what happens when the future is yesterday? And by that I mean we tend to assume that technological innovation is inevitable, that you know what happens as time goes by that we make forward progress, that uh, you know, we're always making one step forward. But what happens rather when you have sort of a devolution of society where we, we and we don't need to go all post-apocalyptic on everyone, but like, you know, what happens if there are sort of warning signs that we haven't been paying attention to where instead of heading towards this utopian techno-determinist ideal 35 years down the road, it's always 35 years down the road, uh, 
we're actually on the verge of entering sort of a prolonged period of slow, subtle decline? Well, uh, the, um, you know, for the first sort of two-thirds of the, the 20th century, we got accustomed to seeing completely new, large, obvious technologies appearing in our lives. So at the beginning of the century, airplanes didn't exist. By the end of the century, flying around in huge jet airplanes and going to the airport were just completely normal behaviors. Um, and um, uh, you know, cars, interstate highways, nuclear reactors, uh, all of these things uh, just, uh, just happened kind of during that century. And I think we became accustomed to, uh, to completely new things uh, entering our urban landscape. Um, in that way, and, and if, that's why if you look at the um, sort of depictions of the future shown during the 1950s, uh, you tend to see flying cars and jetpacks and, and stuff like that, uh, because to them, that's what the future was. It was, uh, uh, they were <laughs> extrapolating this tendency for, for crazy new technologies to suddenly appear in our lives and trying to imagine what those might be. Um, Instead, what we got was digital, you know, the whole cyber thing. And so um, uh, we've kind of taken a detour from uh, that vision of the, the future that, that we had in the 50s. And um, our landscape has changed very little in the sense of new forms of transportation or new kinds of buildings appearing. Um, but the landscape of our day-to-day -day lives has changed pretty radically with things like, uh, you know, portable telephones and iPads and the internet and, and so on. Um, so the, we've been in a period of progress and change that's a lot less obvious, uh, a lot less kind of poke you in the eye than um, what we had in the, the first part of the, the 20th century. And so I think it's easy to... Uh, underestimate how much things have changed um, as the result of that, you know, these cyber, uh, everything that's happened in the, the cyber sphere. Um, so the first thing I'd say is that, um, is that uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure if, if uh, progress has slowed down as, as radically as, it, as, as maybe it, it seems like it has. Um, the uh, uh, but it certainly has slowed down in the area of, of building stuff. So myself, you know, I was uh, enamored of all things cyber uh, for, for a long time there. Um, but I'm kind of tired of cyber crap now. And I mean, I know how important it is and, and how it's changed everything, and I appreciate that. But um, uh, I'm kind of tired of it. and, and I'm more interested in sort of construction of interesting physical objects uh, in the analog world, um, and uh, there there doesn't there's there's been a, a conspicuous kind of fall off in the rate at which we build new stuff like that, and I think it's because all of the smart young people coming out of school have tended to um, to go into digital technology. And so we don't have the kind of reservoir of machinists and engineers and designers that we had, you know, say during the heyday of the of the, the space program or whatever. Um, and um, uh, I'm I'm kind of hoping that'll change. I'd love to see a new wave of physical uh, inventing and physical technology building uh, over the coming uh, decades. Um, and I see signs of that. I see people who. Uh, who are getting very engaged with physically building things uh, with, you know, there's hacker labs uh, uh, popping up in cities all over the place that are devoted not just to hacking on computers but to doing 3D printing and building robots and making stuff. And um, so that you can definitely see the little green shoots poking out of the ground uh, everywhere. Um, but I, I worry that uh, we've switched into a kind of uh, era of uh, austerity and of um, being afraid to, uh, to build radically new stuff uh, that, that may uh, limit uh, how much we can really do. You know, 
it's, it's interesting. So you have the, like the horse and buggy age, and they're dreaming of railroads, and railroad age is dreaming of cars, and the car age is dreaming of planes, and then today we're dreaming of right like diamond age, sort of fold up horses. <laughs> like it, it's a giant loop, but it's using these nanotechnologies, using these new systems. Are, are when you're thinking about like this notion of physical invention, are you talking about nanotechnology sort of physical invention? Is it more sort of a bolts and steampunk-esque kind of? It could be that. It could be big machines. Uh, it, it, uh, it could be, um, you know, something that I, I'm not smart enough to, to, to think of. But um, uh, what I'm seeing, I, you know, I, I see really odd things like the BP oil spill that just went on and on and on and, um, and made me think of the fact that um, when I was a sort of ecologically minded college student a million years ago, the uh, you know I was being told uh, by apparently well-intentioned people that um, wind power and solar power were a little too expensive now, but pretty soon they would become uh, competitive with petroleum, and you know we could redo our energy system. And now I'm kind of shocked to wake up, you know, a bunch of decades later and find out that. Uh, that's not happening. Um, we're still pumping um, strange fluids out of the ground um, as a way of, of getting energy. Uh, and um, so that causes me to wonder sort of what it is that's, that, uh, what's going on with the way our society is organized that we can't just uh, take care of this. Let's look into that a little bit more. In the uh, earlier this week, you described to me sort of that we were in danger of becoming what you call the the Ottoman Empire of the 21st century, and uh, you know it, it it seems like you know we can we could you know poo poo on regulation, but you actually take a moment to say you know it's not that regulation is the singular culprit in this. Uh, you say that, that equally to blame uh, is engineering, management practices, insurance, Congress, even accounting practices. And uh, in your words, you said that we should worry less about possible negative effects of innovation and more about the damage being done to our environment and our prosperity by the mid-20th century technologies that no sane or responsible person would propose today, but in which we re remain trapped by mysterious and ineffable forces. So I'm curious, what are these mysterious forces that you see at play here? Well, that's why they're mysterious. I don't know. But, <laughs> I, I mean, the, like, so if you look at energy, uh, the reason we have petroleum, a petroleum industry, and you know, the, this is, you can look this up on the internet, so that must be true. Um, it all started with the practice of going out in wooden ships and throwing spears at sperm whales and boiling their heads to make lamp fuel. And then when that got too troublesome and expensive, um, somebody figured out that you could uh, subject coal to a process that would produce a liquid fuel called kerosene. And then we moved on from that to pumping oil directly out of the ground. Um, and we've got this whole system now that is erected around that, that practice. And it's highly optimized, and it's kind of locked in by a whole set of regulatory factors and uh, subsidies and, and, um, uh, and, and just by uh, a, a kind of, uh, I would say, cautious uh, mentality uh, that, that says it's better to, uh, to burnish what you've got and to sort of innovate within that and make it slightly more efficient than it is to, uh, to change over to something different. Um, and uh, from a, uh, uh, you know, if you were to, just an alien coming to the planet Earth and sort of figuring out the energy budget and figuring out how the energy system ought to look like, you would notice right away that there's just a ridiculous amount of energy hitting the surface in the form of, of uh, light from the sun and that it shows up in the wind, it shows up in waves. Uh, the entire core of the Earth is a big nuclear reactor that makes heat all the time. You can get heat out of it um, some places more easily than others. But <clears throat> um, uh, it would never occur to any sane person that the way to supply energy to the society was to uh, go around and drill holes in the Earth and suck out uh, you know, decayed plant material from millions of years ago and burn it. Um, 
And so, um, and yet that's kind of where we're stuck and we don't seem to be able to, to get out of that situation. So it's, um, <clears throat> it's tempting to blame it all on regulation and say it's the, the bad government. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's more than that. It's, it's kind of a uh, collective uh, set of, of, uh, of practices and habits that uh, is very difficult to, to break out of, seemingly. You talked a bit about sort of this uh, path dependencies and the lock-ins uh, in your recent Slate article that came out two days ago, mm -hmm. talking about satellites the size of H-bombs. And I'm wondering if you could describe a little bit about how that process unfolds in, that, in space uh, exploration, as it were. Well, I was using space launch technology as one sort of concrete example of these phenomena of, of lock-in uh, and path dependency that I was just talking about in the case of energy. Um, and so um, I don't want to kind of rehash the whole thing here, but uh, the, the idea is that um, there's a bunch of different ways of, that you could launch things into space. Uh, and, and people have, have, uh, have imagined any number of, of uh, alternative launch technologies using lasers or tall buildings or big guns or what have you that um, are at least as plausible as what we do now. Uh, the reason we use rockets is because of some really peculiar historical accidents uh, around um, that happened around the time of, of the Second World War, uh, and um, and once we had settled on that, we optimized that technology uh, to uh, a very high degree and to a point where we can't make it significantly better, um, no matter how much more money we put into it, um, and yet uh, all. Uh, whenever uh, we have a sort of national conversation about what the next space program is going, is going to look like, uh, it's always a, about uh, building another rocket. Um, just as uh, we seem to be stuck on, on petroleum, you know, as our energy system. So, you know, I just think it's kind of interesting. Uh, if you look at all of the huge innovations that we did create in the, the early 20th century, uh, at, at great risk and but with great success uh, that we've lost our ability to uh, to make changes uh, whose necessity seems to be to be quite obvious I remember uh, watching some shows somewhere where they were talking about like medieval weaponry and sort of you know catapults and but what stuck in my brain was the trebuchet yeah and the narrator was talking about how, like, you can just keep building bigger and bigger and bigger trebuchets. There's no limit to the size of trebuchets. So I'm like, space trebuchet, absolutely. <laughs> so, in terms of, uh, I, I I tried to figure that out once, yeah. sharing your obsession with both trebuchets and space, and it's, <laughs> it's pretty hard. <laughs> you you, 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 you got to supply the the energy over. Uh, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, uh, or else everyone dies. So, uh, if you give it to them really in a really short period of time, uh, bad things happen. So, trying to build uh, a sling that can spend 10 or 15 minutes whipping around uh, in that big arc is um, difficult. You, but you've actually thought about this. I mean, like you put. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's excellent. Uh, yesterday's panel, uh, you started talking a little bit about sort of prop the propaganda around uh, technology. So you said the public democratic consensus around science is largely manufactured and that the last 10 or 15 years, the internet sort of while a, a really useful tool for good has also driven sort of cynicism and misinformation. Uh, some might argue like your autobiographical sketch. Uh, <laughs> But you know the perceptions of technology today are really more being drawn amongst the masses by sort of PR people, yeah. and whoever you, you said whoever is best at manipulating public opinion. So what do you think this means for the future of sort of the public's relationship with technologies that you know are, are in essence a black box? We don't really understand how they work. Yeah, well, the 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 kind of. Uh interesting data point for me on that is, is watching the whole birther thing and how that plays out in the, the public sphere. 
because uh, I'm pretty sure that if you were to have private and candid conversations with leading conservatives, uh, that essentially none of them would express the least bit of doubt that President Obama was born in Hawaii. Um, but, um, uh, and, and some of them have, to their credit, have, co have come out and, and tried to sort of put the whole Bertha thing to rest. But there's clearly uh, a one, at least one faction that's thinking, okay, we don't actually believe he was born in Kenya, but it suits our purposes for there to be some people out there uh, in the public who do believe that. And so we're going to, um, we're going to, uh, at, at a minimum, we're going to not discourage them from thinking that. And, and beyond that, maybe we're even going to try to foster doubts uh, ab ab about his, uh, about where he was born. Um, and, and so that is a level of cynicism about, um, about public discourse uh, that uh, feels kind of new to me. And uh, maybe I've just been uh, terribly naive before, uh, uh, and now I'm seeing uh, the way things really are. Or maybe it really is kind of a new benchmark uh, in how devious people are willing to, to be. But, um, but it's very easy. Uh, if you want to pursue those kinds of strategies, it's, it's very easy to do that on the internet um, because people just don't have uh, filters in their heads yet for what they see on the internet. Um, and so um, uh, if that's how it's going to be, then I would say that you know, whenever any kind of new technology is, is proposed, whether it's a wind turbine or a nuclear reactor or solar uh, so, you know, photovoltaic cells in the desert, uh, someone's ox is going to get gored by that uh, new uh, technology. And that someone can always uh, put up uh, a website or put some information out um, that's going to scare people to death and, and uh, cause them to oppose the uh, implementation of that, of that change. I mean, so that's sort of the, in, the misinformation side of things. There's also sort of the, you know, the general ignorance side. It's, it's been said, you know, like when technology becomes significantly advanced, the difference between technology and magic disappears. And, you know, it seems to me like, I don't, I don't know, well, in this audience, probably a lot of people know how their iPhone works or <laughs> what have you. But, you know, in the general populace, more and more we're having technologies that do things that even to two generations ago would seem almost magical. I remember watching uh, like Star Trek, you know, the, and you'd have like little things where they wouldn't have to push a button, they could just run their fingers over the board and it would do stuff. And that seemed like that was science fiction of yeah. 15 years ago. Yeah, and well, a lot of the stuff is complicated enough that even the people who are building it don't have a kind of synoptic view of how it all works. It's all, yeah, you know, it's, there's, specialists in, in different subsystems who know how to make one bit of it work. Uh, and, and no one's kind of got the, the, the big view of it. Um, yeah, that doesn't make things any easier. Um, but even in um, kind of simpler things like, uh, uh, say, putting up a wind farm, uh, that's a pretty straightforward technology. Um, that most people can understand how that works. Uh, but it's 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 easy to um, to create doubt in people's minds about you know are the turbine blades uh, going to kill birds? Um, is there uh, a sound that comes out of the, the turbine that's going to uh, mess with people's uh, uh, health somehow at, at a distance? Um, and um, and and what I was getting at uh, in the bit you quoted earlier is that. Um, uh, if, if, if somebody proposed now to create the, uh, the petroleum industry from nothing, then um, that would come off as just unhinged insanity. Um, you know, once people became aware of all of the environmental side effects and, and hazards associated with that, but for whatever reason, you know, the existing stuff doesn't get uh, scrutiny in the same way as, uh, as new things. And um, this is what I was getting at in some of my comments uh, to you earlier about sort of how we use the word technology. 
Uh, the, it seems like the word technology in our public discourse is reserved for things that just got invented very recently. Uh, and anything that's old uh, that we're kind of used to seeing around us, uh, that's not technology. That's just the way things are, uh, almost like it's a part of the natural world. And so um, it's, it's, it's the, I, I think we need to start looking at everything we've got as technology uh, and, and sort of uh, evaluating it all kind of fairly uh, according to the same uh, terms and, and, and instead of worrying about uh, a possible uh, side effect of a new energy system, uh, try to weigh that against uh, the benefits of, you know, getting rid of an oil well. So if you have a misinformation on the one hand, you've got ignorance on the other, and then you have this, which, you know, you've stated that you try to avoid the easy, the glib, and the oversimplified in my books. Uh, what attracts you to complexity? Well, that's, that's an awfully self-congratulatory thing for me to have said. <laughs> <laughs> wow, when did I write that? Uh, 2005. Yeah. I'm so much wiser now. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, I mean, your books do require of the reader to really immerse themselves into worlds and thought processes. You, you seem to take a certain glee in providing, I mean, like looking at the calca. These are sort of, uh, you can think of them as appendices to an athem where, I mean, he's literally walking you through fundamentals of geometry in some of these things. Like, you do like the complex, and I'm curious, you know, what attracts you to that complexity? You've talked a little bit about, you know, that, you know, the oversimplification is almost what leads to these problems down the road, and yet there's a tension between, like, the easy message, the propagandistic kind of message, and well, it's, the complete... I mean, it goes back to what I said earlier, which, which is that, uh, I mean, largely it's, it's a... F uh, it's a f fictional technique um, that's intended to uh, instill in the reader's mind, you know, the illusion uh, that, that this, this world has to be real because there's so much complicated junk in it. Uh, so how could it, how could it possibly be just a, a fake? Um, so um, a, a lot of it's that. Uh, the, um, I'm not sure if it even requires much more. You know, I was reading uh, Robert Heinlein, uh, some of his earlier works, uh, about half a year or so ago. And one of the things, two, two things really stuck with me. One is uh, he has a book where he talks about how basically the moon becomes a gigantic knowledge repository and how you can ask any question and it's so mechanized in such an advanced manner that they can get you answers within a matter of hours to any question that you might have. And that was like, Impossible. <laughs> yes, the mechanistic future. And the others, he has a whole story centered around a brain transplant. And at the end of the story, the end of the story, the, the, one of the protagonists in there saw, talks about how next what he's really going to try to do is a heart-lung transplant. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm thinking, like, you know, have there been surprises for you? I mean, you've been writing for a quarter of a century now in terms of technologies that either you had expected in these sort of near future narratives would be with us now, or the flip side of that, you know, ones that are here now that you wouldn't have expected over that time frame. Well, the, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, a true but not very interesting answer is the internet and, everything connected with that. Um, so that's, I mean, everyone was surprised by that. And you can kind of see science fiction for the last 25 years or so as, as being in a kind of tailspin as it uh, tries to absorb this gigantic thing that happened that it wasn't ready for and didn't really predict. So uh, in, in, uh, in the 70s, we've got the, the view of computers as, as seen in Star Trek or 2001, you know, and, uh, and, and then this, the, the reality of, of, of how computers develop kind of blindsided us. And um, I think cyberpunk uh, and, and that whole wing of science fiction is, is just us trying to wrap our, our heads around it. Uh, 
So, um, so there's that, and you know, I guess I've already said that, uh, you know, I was led to believe that um, that by the time uh, I was uh, 40 or certainly 50, I'd be uh, hanging around in space stations, uh, going for strolls on the surface of Mars, etc. Uh, and so that just totally, obviously, you know, failed to uh, to materialize. There's no jetpacks, you know, none of the none of the cool stuff uh, that I was uh, led to look forward to uh, is seems to be around. So it's like iPhone, yes, jetpack, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. All the teenagers out there are like, damn it. Uh, but so I'm going to turn this over for questions from all of you in a moment. And what I'm going to ask you to do as we get situated for that is that you keep your questions to or commentary to 30 seconds or less. It's going to be tough. Uh, and I'll ask one final question of you before turning it over. Okay. Um, what's the status of Mongoliad? And can you explain a little bit about how you decided to make the leap from writing on paper with a fountain pen to sort of multimedia mobile New wave extravaganza narrative well, technique. Well, it's not. It's not so you're you're referring to a serialized novel uh, called *The Mongolia* that I'm co-writing with um, six other uh, writers, and it's an experiment in uh, serialized content uh, on the internet. Uh, it's a subscription-based thing. Um, you pay your money, and you get. Um, you get a new chapter every week, uh, and it's, it's going to look like one of those great big kind of 19th century serialized adventure books, except that uh, the distribution medium is iPhones and iPads and the web, and uh, hopefully other devices uh, as we can kind of bring those online. Um, the, uh, it's not uh, meant to be some kind of radical break with existing ways of writing uh, or uh, existing uh, uh, means of publishing things uh, as a way of, uh, of, of trying to come to grips with um, the changes that are obviously coming in the publishing industry uh, in a way that will kind of do the minimum amount of violence to the uh, uh, sanity and the bank accounts of writers and uh, publishing-minded uh, folks uh, alike. So it's, uh, uh, the, the Mongoliad is the first thing that we're publishing this way, um, but uh, we hope there will be others. And we're building, we're working on building the, the infrastructure we need to uh, to make that happen. Great. So we have time for a few questions. Folks, we'll start right here in front. Hi. Uh, we on now? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sean Hayes, Arizona State University, um, and I'll stay within the 30 seconds. Please. Uh, first, do you find it at all amusing, having, re having written The Big U, that uh, the nation's largest public university is partly responsible for your being here? <laughs> um, and, and second, you mentioned yesterday, I, I've, I, I've designed a course that I've taught for a number of years at Arizona State University, the backbone of which is Snow Crash. Um, and they read several chapters a week, and it's hard. It's part of how I try and get them to understand what life in a different socio-technical context would feel like. Um, and you mentioned a story yesterday that you said might be apocryphal, and I was wondering if you could expand on the apocrypha because it it it, it, it sort of stunned me when you said that there were actually people in uh, who were tossing down snow crash and saying this is our business plan. I was wondering if maybe you could you, you could point to specifically what aspect of it did they consider to be their their business plan? Oh, yeah. When that oh, when that story was going around, it was when virtual reality was was uh, quite the buzzword, and so it was it was I think a kind of all-purpose way of saying we want to do something uh, multiplayer online um, with. Uh, with VR com components, um, but uh, I, I think like all such stories, it's just uh, it's, it's all d d depends on on what kind of point that you're you're the, the teller of the story is trying to make. So, this gentleman right here, and after that, we'll come over to you, sir. Morning. Morning. 
I think it's on. It's on. Yeah. Uh, ben Schneiderman, University of Maryland. Uh, thanks for your fun visions. And uh, I wonder what you'd think about uh, what I see as the technology that's equivalent to the size and complexity of the network uh, of the internet, which is electronic health records. The volume of data, the impact on people's lives, and actually it's more universality and reaches out to a larger fraction of the population. Yet it's sadly broken in very serious ways and harmful and deadly to the tune of killing 98,000 people a year possibly because of, of medical errors. Uh, how does that figure in your future? How do electronic health records become either a successful or a dire outcome? Uh, I haven't, um, I, I've been kind of watching uh, the, the advent of, of this issue, I guess you could say, for a little bit. I have close relatives in the healthcare business and so I get to hear kind of a ground level narrative of what's going on with that. And um, obviously I deal with that whenever I go to the doctor. Um, uh, but um, I have to admit I haven't personally put enough thought into it to, uh, to really have anything interesting to say, I guess. Um, I mean, it's, yeah, well, I, I mean, uh, it, it, it sounds like fodder for uh, a, another uh, sprawling dystopian novel if somebody wanted to to, to take it on um, but but yeah the, the the amount of information and its importance to people's lives is uh, is is pretty staggering and sort of generally uh, under acknowledged I guess you know so. go here and back to Missy we need a trebuchet for hurling uh, the microphone exactly. I think it's just highly directional. The microphone's highly directional, but it's working. So okay. I it, is, it, is, it is working. I'm talking directly into it. Um, I'm just wondering what you think of the idea that uh, Sherry Turkle now has in a recent book that she just put out, Alone Together, in which she basically says that uh, internet technology and robotic technology is giving an illusion of connectedness uh, that's really untrue and in fact harmful because what it does is detract from real human interaction. Instead we're drawn into this appearance of connectedness through social media and so forth, but it's really kind of a madness as she puts it. And, and the future she sees is kind of going further and further in that direction. In that direction, yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I've been hearing uh, Sherry's thoughts on that for actually quite a while. Um, uh, we were on some panels together, you know, at least ten years ago, when she was starting to work on that stuff. And 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 um, for me, uh, as long as it's about sort of robots, that I, I find it a little less immediate. Um, uh, and so it, I, I always tended to kind of uh, push it uh, to the bottom of my list of things to worry about, since not that many people are currently interacting with. Uh, with with robots, but uh, but I I think uh, when when she's talking about the internet in general, which we do interact with all the time, then it actually does uh, become more of an of an issue. And um, uh, you know, Jaron Lanier in particular, in his book uh, "You Are Not a Gadget," um, has some great things to say about the. Uh, uh, how on, on Facebook, uh, you know, you can check the box that says you're single or the box that says you're in a relationship, but there's no gradations. There's no, you know, in, in real life, you know, it's always complicated, you know, and, uh, uh, or it's usually complicated. You and can try to work this into an anthem, right? You have like the 16 levels of relationship status. <laughs> yeah, within there. Their tradition, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, I don't have. I guess I don't have anything really pungent uh, to say about it. You, you know, it's uh, it's certainly. I, I hope it's one of those things that will get better um, as as people express their dissatisfaction and 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 other uh, innovators come along with better stuff. I've been told we're at time, so I'm going to take one last question here in the front. Uh, this is what you get when you sit in the front, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I 
I'm at, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm Mitzi Worth. I'm with the Naval Postgraduate School. I haven't read any of your stuff, but in listening to you, one of the things that strikes me that's missing is the emotion of human beings. And part of the problem. Are you saying I have a flat affect? <laughs> <laughs> you can pick it up any way you want. Okay. Um, I am struck by the problems you're describing, which has to be people not being, not wanting to change. And so there's this basic human resistance to a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And the United States has had some disadvantages in technically being ahead of the game. With television, we were 524 pixels. The Europeans <coughs> got it up to, no, 512, the Europeans got it up to 1,024, and, but we get locked in early on. It's kind of the way we're locked in with our roads, and we no longer have free space in which to create all of this stuff. Yeah. But I'm, I'm interested in your human being component of this. Well, I mean, the, the most important uh, human emotional component uh, during the 20th century you know, was just abject terror which turns out to be a great motivator uh, w when you want to you know, build a, a, a rocket or a great big huge bombs or certain, I mean even the interstate highway system you know, was, uh, was sort of put in um, for, for you know, it was the de defense highway system. So it's part of the, the whole kind of Cold War mindset. Um, so, uh, it, it, it's really easy to motivate people that way, and it seems to be a lot harder to motivate them with things like hope, uh, or uh, you know, uh, just a, a vague desire to make the world a, a better place. Um, right, right now, um, but we don't have any uh, particular thing to focus our abject terror on, and so it's just kind of free floating, and we're sort of scared of everything, uh, and uh, and nothing's getting done. Scared of everything, nothing's getting done. Words of wisdom from Neil Stevenson. <laughs>